I've been introduced to some interesting people throughout my life. One of those people was Vasco. Vasco was a government minister in Bulgaria. He was the minister for prisons. And so we did some work with him and we were involved in some of the prison work there, which was not very pretty to see in some of the conditions. This was before Bulgaria came into the European Union, before a lot of the reforms that we've seen in recent years. So it was a tough environment, but Vasco was quite a character. He was very extrovert in how he did things. He was a little bit risque in some of his jokes and some of his language. So it was always interesting if you were in a public environment or public meeting with him. I remember one time we were due to do uh, a large meeting in an auditorium in, in central Sofia in Bulgaria. And I was taking part in the program. My friend was as well. And also Vasco was taking part. Vasco turned up with a very large cowboy hat. He also turned up with a belt with a massive buckle. And to complement things, he had the biggest pair of cowboy boots that I've ever seen. In fact, he had everything but the gun. And knowing Vasco, I was a little bit nervous that maybe even that would make an appearance. So he got on stage and sh shared a little bit of his story. And that was a, a very nervous time because, as Kerry pointed out to us earlier, that actually, like, like Saul, Vasco was strong-willed. He could be stubborn. He, he liked to get his own way. And he was certainly in a position of high power in his government. And we're going to look a little bit at the, the life of Saul today and, and see what we can learn about God and how God worked in his life. As we said earlier, I'll include some of the, the PowerPoints and the visuals for you a little bit later when we upload it. But I, I want us to look at two things. Firstly, that, that God can work even in the most challenging of people. If you've ever watched any of the reality TV programs... One of the things they, they often do is the sad music comes on and then they give a, a little bio or a little backstory, I think is what they call it, into people's lives and the circumstances and, and how they got to that place where they're now on national television. Well, Paul has a bit of a backstory as well and we read it in the book of Acts. I'm reading from the end of chapter 7 of Acts starting at chapter 8. Saul was one of the witnesses to the death of Stephen, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. After that, a great wave, wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them in prison. And then in chapter 9, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation and the rest the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. You're beginning to get a little bit of a, a picture of Paul, aren't you? You see him as a very strong, determined character. But at this point in his life, he's, he's blind to the reality and blind to the truth about Jesus Christ. In fact, we, we read on in, in chapter 9, and we saw in the, the, the little bit of the animation, where he, on the way to Damascus, he has this encounter with a great light. Later, he reflects that, that others saw the light, but didn't hear the voice that he did, which was really challenging him about his lifestyle, challenging him about what he was doing. So much so that Paul has to be led by the hand. He's blinded, and he's becoming dependent on others. This guy that was breathing out threats, who was taking charge, who was taking the initiative to try and destroy the church, suddenly becomes dependent and helpless. 
I think there's a number of applications from this story to us. I think the first one is that, that we shouldn't write ourselves off. You know, maybe you've come and, and you're listening to this and, and you have some history, some baggage, as people might say, some things that you wouldn't want a lot of people to know. And maybe you're thinking, well, this message of good news, it's for someone else. It's not for me. I, I'm too far gone. The good news is God doesn't write you off, so you shouldn't write yourself off. And in the story, I like the touch of honesty that's described here because it says in verse 2 that some devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. These were people who, who knew where Stephen had gone. He'd gone to be in the presence of Jesus. He knew, they knew they would see him again. But in the middle of this, they had grief. They, they were mourning. And I think that's really helpful for us to know that even in the midst of understanding our future, understanding our security, that actually it's right to grieve. We should grieve for those we lost. And sometimes I hear people kind of trying to push that grief and that loss down. But actually, once we're out of this pandemic, I think one of the things we're going to have to deal with is, is grief and loss during this period. Maybe loss of individuals, maybe loss of a career, maybe loss of opportunities that we thought we were going to pursue. Maybe you shouldn't write yourself off. Maybe you need to be honest with God. And that includes the difficult emotions of anger, sadness, and grief. I don't think we should write others off either. I was sharing with my friend this week of how we're into, what, the fifth week of lockdown now in the UK. And some people have been longer than that if they've had to isolate themselves and maybe nerves are getting a little bit frayed. Maybe tempers are a little bit short. Maybe fuses are a little bit short. Maybe we're just getting that little bit upset with one another quicker than we would have under different circumstances if we weren't in lockdown. It's so easy to judge other people. It's so easy to judge one another. I, I don't know if you've found yourself thinking it if you've been out and about and thinking, why are those people out? Why are those people doing this? Why are those people doing it? It's so easy to come to a place of judgment of other people when we don't know their circumstances, we don't know their history, we don't know what it is they're having to deal with. So maybe we need to cut people some slack. The third person that I think we need to not write off is, is God. Now that may seem strange to you, I'm not writing God off, but actually, people can. When they're facing great disappointment, when they're facing circumstances that aren't comfortable, they can come to a place where they say, well, how can God be in this? I can't see. But in the story of, of Paul, we see that Jesus really identifies with the church. Jesus comes and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Let, let me read it to you. The story goes on. As Saul was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one who you're persecuting. I, I think that's a, a great encouragement to us to realize that Jesus identifies with us, that Jesus understands what it's like to suffer, and that when we suffer as God's people, that he's right there along with us. The truth is, God doesn't always answer the prayers the way we want. Sometimes he does disappointments. In fact, the Bible says sometimes it seems as if God hides himself. You know, God isn't like a one-armed bandit where we put the, the money in the slot, pull the arm, and suddenly we hit the jackpot. He's not a sugar daddy who will automatically answer our every whim. But the consistent witness of Scripture says this. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong Upright and just is he. 
Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 31. In your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions or sins, and it is by grace that you've been saved. See, the truth is, God can work even in the most challenging of people because his nature is always for us. The second thing we can learn about God is that God can work even through the most challenging circumstances. The early church faced persecution. Early on, it was through this guy that we've just met, Saul, who later turned into Paul. And other parts of the book of Acts, we see that the church are facing great persecution. In fact, they're scattered because of it. Chapter 8 talks about what happens as Saul is persecuting Let me read verse 3 and 4 to you. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them in prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. That's what happened as a result of the persecution. The book of Hebrews in the Bible records some uncomfortable truths about what people faced in order to follow God. Let me read a little bit to you. This is what it says. These were people who were tortured. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute living and mistreated They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. Definitely a lot worse than any lockdown that we're facing. Definitely worse than any challenges that that we're currently facing. This is uncomfortable. But even then, God was at work. God was using the church. We've just read it. They were spreading the word wherever they went. Later on, once Paul has his conversion experience he reflects on 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 what has to happen and what he has plans to do and it says that he traveled around on his trips strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith he says we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of god That's what Paul found. The one who was persecuting others found that when he followed Christ, when he did what was right, that he himself became the object of persecution. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he lists a number of things that he actually faced himself. He said five times he got 39 lashes. Three times he was beaten with rods. Three times he was left shipwrecked. He said, I was constantly on the move. I've often gone without sleep. I've found myself cold and naked. He was often hungry, he says elsewhere. And yet, in spite of all this, in spite of the persecutions, in spite of the difficulties, he was committed to following God. God, in fact, at one stage, he was in lockdown for two years. Two years of house arrest. But this is what he said to one church. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else that I am in a change for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I find that an incredible statement. Startling, in fact, that Paul could reflect on all those beatings and those shipwrecks and the hunger and the suffering that he faced and all the concerns that he has. And yet he said, don't worry about me, guys. This is actually, God is working in these circumstances to advance the message that I have. 
Elsewhere, he writes to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 10, and this is what he says. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We're always carrying about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be made manifest in our body. Paul knew what it was like to be left for dead. In fact, history records that he was executed at the hands of the Romans. Have you ever considered in your own life how God may be working through this lockdown, this difficult circumstances, maybe other hardships that you're facing, maybe other pressures that you're facing, and you're wondering how can God bring good purposes out of that? There's one Christian writer that I think has, has really nailed it for all of us. Nailed the issue, and this is what he says. The first thing that God asks of us, that asks of us is control. And the last thing that we want to give up is control. Let me say that again. The first thing God asks of us is control. And the last thing that we want to give up is control. I think that's true. I think that's true in my own life. I think that's probably true in your life as well. God comes and he's not looking for external tidiness. <laughs> he's not looking for what car we drive. He's not looking at our bank balance. He's looking, are we willing to give up control? Are we willing to surrender? Are we willing to say yes to him? Paul learned that even his weakness, that God's weakness is stronger than Paul's own strength. How about you? As you look at the circumstances, are you, are you trying to control things? Are you trying to work everything out? Are you trying to have your, your plans or what you're going to do when lockdown finishes or how you're going to move on or when it should happen? Maybe you're an armchair cabinet minister. We've heard of armchair generals. Maybe you're an armchair cabinet minister and, and you know what the government should do. Do you know what? The only confidence and security we have is actually placing our life in God's purposes and placing our life in God's hands. I want to finish with some challenging words from Paul. This is what he says. Bearing in mind his own life, his changes, bearing in mind the difficulty he had come from, from bearing in mind the persecution he had faced, this is what he says. I know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Powerful words. Motivating words, I think. I come to you in conclusion as I finish and Amelia and Keegan are going to come back in a moment. And I want you to think about, do you know what your purpose is? Do you have that sense that you're running a race? Do you have that sense that there's an aim in your life? Do you have that sense that Paul did where he said, God has taken hold of me for a very definite purpose and because of that, I've experienced his grace. The best decision that you can make today is to give up control. <laughs> it's an illusion anyhow. Give up control. Give up and surrender to him. Will you do that today? Will you say yes to God? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the incredible story Many of us may be familiar with the story of Saul, who you changed into Paul. The story of someone who was stubborn, proud, self-willed. But you came, and in an encounter with you, he humbled himself, and his life was turned around. You didn't write him off. We thank you, God, for that. 
We also thank you, God, that you're working in every circumstance, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of pressure, because you're a good God. So, Father, I pray that you would help us as your people to give up control, to surrender to you, whatever stage we're at in our journey, to say yes to you today. And we pray that in Jesus' name. If you'd like to get in touch with us, we'd we'd love to hear from you, whether that's by email, whether that's through Facebook, whether that's through our website. Please get in touch with us and we would love to help you. Thank you.